Terrific. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with the Brain Turns. Uh, my name is Nicholas Skipitaris. Uh, I'm a cardiologist uh, with a particular area of expertise in the heart's electrical system. Uh, and today we're going to uh, go from a, a start with a very basic uh, introduction uh, to uh, the heart's electrical system uh, in our in our talk entitled "Electricity Makes the Heart Go Round." So. You all probably uh, are very well familiar with uh, the heart uh, as being a, a pump uh, responsible for, uh, as a muscular structure, it pumps blood uh, uh, from its uh, powerful uh, vent ventricles, which are the bottom chambers of the heart, and I'll show you that in a moment, uh, into the aorta, the main um, artery that takes blood away from the heart, and then uh, through the circulatory system, which branches you know, throughout the body and supplies the body with uh, important nutrients and oxygen uh, and, and the blood flow that's uh, critical for life. Uh, but as we all know, uh, no uh, pump uh, can work without some um, coordination. Uh, so all of these chambers uh, in the heart, and there are basically four chambers in the normal heart. Uh, there are two upper chambers that are called the atria, and here's a cross section of the heart. So if you just sliced this, this heart uh, in the lengthwise along this way, you see the four chambers here. Uh, two upper chambers called the atria, and then two bottom chambers called the ventricles. Uh, and uh, these uh, structures here are the valves that separate the uh, uh, right atrium from the right ventricle uh, and the, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, left atrium from the left ventricle and the uh, right atrium from the right ventricle uh, and keeps the blood moving uh, in a forward fashion so that the blood gets uh, pumped out uh, to the rest of the body. But these, these intricate uh, relationships between these compartments and the valves have to be uh, organized in a way, and the thing that's responsible for organizing that is the electrical system, uh, which is built into the muscle of the heart. And I just want to show you a quick uh, YouTube video, which actually explains uh, uh, this very, very nicely, uh, and then we'll, we'll dive a little uh, deeper into that. So hang in there one second. Uh, The cardiac conduction system uh, we can't of see the video. components. You can't the see the video? The node. No. The uh, right, node. Hold on a sec. Located maybe, uh, in the... maybe stop screen sharing and start it up again. Yep, yep. Uh, share screen. On. Sorry, guys, one second. Well, we'll 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 uh, <laughs> we'll go the other route here. Hold on. So uh, the. Um, if, if, if I can't to, to convince you that the heart is also uh, an electrical system, uh, I will show you uh, this, uh, which is that, uh, that of a normal EKG. So um, many of you uh, may uh, have had an EKG in your lifetime or have seen an EKG, uh, but basically what an EKG is, uh, it is a... Uh, uh, a, a, a summation of all the electrical activity uh, that's going on in the heart uh, at, ev at any given moment. And this is a picture of a normal EKG. Uh, and uh, it basically is a recording of the electrical signals that are going on with every single heartbeat. So to give you uh, a better understanding of the EKG, each and every one of these little squiggles uh, corresponds to some activity uh, in the heart. 
uh, and each of these little little uh, uh, waves uh, have a, a different name. So the uh, first little bump that we see uh, in the EKG is something called a P wave. And we see this P wave in each and every one of these leads. And it just uh, has a different, uh, a, a different vector just because each and every one of these leads is looking at the heart from a different angle. Uh, so in the case of this lead, uh, the P wave uh, is upright because the electrical wave of de of depolarization is coming towards this towards this lead. So the normal uh, heartbeat is made up of a P wave, something called a QRS complex, and then this is a, a T wave. So it's P Q R S T, just like the alphabet. And each and every one of these uh, squiggles corresponds to some action uh, in the heart. So let me, uh, let me go, go back to my um, uh, uh, image uh, for a moment uh, of the uh, chambers of the heart. Um, so the P wave corresponds to the electrical signal that causes the two upper chambers of the heart, the atria, to contract. The QRS, complex, which is the sharp squiggle, which I'll show you again in a moment, corresponds to the electrical activity of the muscle of the bottom chambers of the heart or the ventricles as they squeeze. And so you see that uh, when you look at a normal EKG, you have a, uh, a sequence of events that corresponds to the uh, electrical sequence of events, which then create the uh, signal for the muscle of the heart to contract. So you have a P wave, which corresponds to the atria contracting, which then pump the blood through the valves, uh, through the atrioventricular valves into the bottom chambers of the heart or the, the ventricles. And then when the ventricles receive the blood, you see the QRS complex, which corresponds to the, um, the contraction of the uh, 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 workhorses of the heart, the bottom chambers of the heart. Uh, and then the T wave is a recovery of the electrical system. So this is a uh, depolarization and this is a repolarization event. So you have depolarization of the atria and then depolarization of the ventricles and then repolarization of both with recovery and then the whole sequence uh, resumes. And each and every one of these beats corresponds to a heartbeat. And so you, you see here. Uh, that this is a normal uh, EKG uh, where people's normal heart rates are in the 60 to 100 range uh, in adults. And so uh, this is a, a heart rate of approximately 60 beats per minute. You can see here uh, that the electrical system uh, is on the sluggish side and this heart uh, is beating uh, a little bit on the slow side. Uh, but again, you see that similar sequence of events. You see the P wave, you see the QRS, and then you see the T wave. Um, if you look in a different lead, you see the same uh, sequence of events, which just corresponds to a different heartbeat. But again, P wave, QRS, and T wave. Uh, it's just that the rate, as you look at this, is on the slow side. Here's what a heart looks like when it's going very rapidly. And uh, it, you know sometimes the, the P waves uh, or what's going on in between because it's so rapid or a little bit more difficult to discern or to, or, or to discriminate. Uh, but again, I assure you that the, uh, 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 the sequence of events in this particular EKG uh, remains the same, where you have an atrial contraction, uh, then a ventricular contraction, as noted by the QRS, and then a repolarization. Just to compare all of these uh, all together, here's what a, a normal uh, rhythm uh, and normal heart rate looks like. Here's what a very slow heart rhythm looks like um, uh, on an EKG. And here's what a very fast heart rhythm uh, looks like uh, on, on an EKG. Uh, here's a different scenario where the heart is beating irregularly. And if you look very closely, and you can see it very nicely here, if we look at the, where we would expect 
to see the P waves uh, between each and every one of these QRS complexes because they're still called QRS complexes. What we don't see very distinctly are P waves. In fact, we see a lot of chaos. It looks like a very disorganized, almost noisy electrical system. Uh, and in fact, this is a different kind of heart rhythm, uh, something called atrial fibrillation, where the atria, the upper chambers of the heart, are actually not squeezing in a nice organized fashion, which shows you the, the typical P wave on the EKG, but in fact, they're wriggling about, they're fibrillating. Uh, and, and there's a, um, a disorganized contraction uh, of the uh, 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 electrical system of the heart and a disorganized muscular contraction as a result of the disorganized electrical uh, situation. So um, again, to impress upon you that uh, the, the mechanical contraction of the heart uh, is dependent upon the electrical system of the heart and that's what uh, a cardiac electrophysiologist like myself, that's what we do. So what is cardiac electrophysiology? Uh, it's a branch of uh, the medical specialty of cardiology, uh, of uh, heart uh, ailments. Uh, we are specifically concerned with the study and treatment of any kind of rhythm disorder of the heart. Um, uh, any, uh, we are electricians of the heart, uh, uh, and our, again, our technical term is uh, electrophysiologists. Uh, we work very closely with other uh, heart doctors, uh, both uh, uh, general cardiologists and cardiac surgeons uh, to assist them or guide therapy uh, in the management of all types of heart rhythm disturbances, which are also called arrhythmias. Uh, and cardiac electrophysiologists like myself uh, are trained to perform interventional and minor surgical procedures to treat uh, uh, various uh, cardiac rhythm abnormalities, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of that uh, in a few in a few moments. Uh, so, uh, when uh, are uh, electricians of the heart uh, or cardiac electrophysiologists required? Um, basically, any and every patient with a heart rhythm disorder can benefit from um, from from our evaluation. Uh, and uh, we have a very, very busy uh, inpatient and outpatient uh, service. Uh, we see patients of all ages. Um, as an adult electrophysiologist, uh, I start seeing uh, uh, patients uh, once they turn uh, 18 uh, and all the way till end of life. Uh, I've taken care of patients uh, who've been 104, 105 uh, years old. Uh, and um, uh, uh, we see uh, patients with all different types of um, uh, uh, heart issues uh, and uh, because everyone has a heart and everyone's heart is driven by the heart's electrical system. Uh, in, in particular, what are the, some of the common symptoms that people might experience uh, that would result uh, in them needing to see an electrician for the heart? Uh, well, some of the common ones are palpitations or the sense of uh, uh, feeling your heart beating in your chest. Uh, and those palpitations can either be irregular, strong, or very, very rapid. Uh, sometimes uh, people feel extra or skipped beats. Um, dizziness or lightheadedness uh, when you wouldn't expect to be dizzy or lightheaded uh, sometimes is a sign of a rhythm abnormality. Uh, more seriously, fainting or loss of consciousness, uh, which uh, if you don't wake up from a loss of consciousness event, uh, it might mean that uh, uh, you've had something even more uh, serious happen, something called uh, a sudden cardiac arrest or, or cardiac arrest or sudden death. Uh, some of you may have heard of that. Um, so what do we do? Uh, well, uh, in the uh, electrophysiology laboratory, uh, which is the uh, uh, a place where we do most of our uh, inpatient evaluations, we can basically do a, um, uh, a very uh, uh, detailed investigation of the heart's electrical system. Um, so uh, I showed you some pictures of EKGs, which are taken 
uh, from the outside of the patient's body where they, we put some electrodes all over the chest and on the arms. And the EKG that you saw before uh, is basically a summation of all the electrical activity uh, seen from different aspects, but from the outside of the heart. Well, in our electrophysiology laboratory, we can do something called an electrophysiology study where we can place these fancy catheters through veins in the leg or in the neck and pass those catheters up into the heart. And these catheters or thin wires have electrodes depicted here by these little silver uh, or whitish uh, dots uh, on these blue wires or blue catheters. And by placing these catheters in various locations in the heart, we could measure specifically what's going on at this location between these two electrodes at this location between these two electrodes, in this location in the ventricle between these two electrodes, and each and every one of these signals uh, is a local measured electrical signal as seen on each and every one of these electrodes. So to give you an example, uh, this um, particular wire, which looks like it's coming in from the neck, oops, uh, looks like it's coming in from the neck through a, a, a large vein called the superior vena cava, is entering the right atrium, and then going into a, a little structure called the coronary sinus. And this electrode here, the electrical signal that's being measured there, is depicted here uh, and from, uh, from a, an electrogram, we call it, uh, call, uh, that is uh, labeled the distal coronary sinus. This catheter, which is in the right ventricle, is showing us uh, an electrogram or an electrical signal from these two electrodes in the right ventricle. And you can see the EKG that I showed you uh, before with a P wave and a QRS, that the signals correspond to the location of these catheters. So for instance, this catheter here, which is in the atrium or the high right atrium, is here. And this high right atrial signal corresponds locally to the P wave that we see on the surface EKG. The right ventricular catheter or wire, which is in the right ventricle, corresponds to the QRS complex, which I told you earlier is the um, uh, 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 contraction of the um, uh, ventricles. And so you see here locally uh, the electrical signal that we see from the catheter that's placed in the right ventricle. So we can interpret this and basically this uh, is a single beat of uh, a single heartbeat, P wave, QRS. This is what it looks like measuring those signals from inside the heart. Uh, and we can create uh, and reproduce the electrical circuit diagram of a patient's heart. Beyond that, we can actually stimulate the heart or actually deliver small, uh, 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 small charges or small electrical stimuli from any one of these uh, electrodes that are in the heart and see how the heart's electrical system will respond to the electrical stimulation that we give. And the response that we see on these signals uh, tells us a lot about the patient's um, uh, electrical system. Uh, and allows us to evaluate the patient's electrical system. And that's what we do during an electrophysiology study. But there are more things an electrophysiologist does. Let's say a patient has an abnormal uh, electrical system where let's say the uh, uh, electrical system which uh, uh, connects the upper chamber of the heart uh, to the bottom chamber of the heart, let's say there's an interruption in the wiring of the, of the normal wiring of the heart, well, uh, an electrophysiologist implants a pacemaker, uh, which puts in a permanent wire in the upper chamber and a permanent wire in the bottom chamber of the heart connected to a pacemaker, which looks like this. If you look at my screen here, this is uh, what a normal pacemaker looks like. Uh, it's it's a uh, smaller than the palm of my hand. Uh, and uh, that's what uh, this, um, this device here uh, represents. And it's implanted in a little pocket that we make 
underneath the skin during a minor surgical procedure. And basically the pacemaker takes over the role of the patient's uh, uh, abnormal electrical system uh, and can frankly be a life-saving uh, life device. And as I showed you with the, uh, uh, the temporary wires that we place uh, in various locations in the heart, a permanent pacemaker um, can be placed uh, in, in those same chambers uh, but uh, the idea of uh, these wires is that they're not going to be removed, uh, hopefully for the rest of the, the, the patient's life. Uh, and they uh, keep, uh, can, can keep the heart rate and rhythm nice and regular. Uh, so here's a, here's a real story just to, to put into perspective for you. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the clinical presentation of a 76-year-old gentleman who came to the emergency department after fainting or passing out multiple times. And what would we expect to see on an EKG? But this, and now that you guys have become experts at reading EKGs, I'm gonna walk you through it. Remember we said that the, a normal EKG has a P wave that's followed by a QRS complex. The P wave is the upper chamber of the heart, the upper chambers of the heart squeezing, and the QRS complex is the bottom chambers of the heart squeezing. So what do we see here? We see a P wave, but no QRS. Another P wave and no QRS. Oh my goodness, the bottom chamber of the heart is not squeezing. If the bottom chamber of the heart is not squeezing, then the blood is not circulating the way that it's supposed to to provide uh, the necessary blood circulation or perfusion to the brain and to the other critical organs, the liver, the lungs, the kidneys, um, and in fact, uh, uh, in this situation, uh, the patient uh, is severely compromised, uh, and fortunately for him, he didn't die because there is a, an escape rhythm, and you see these sharper signals, which do correspond to a QRS complex, but they come in at a very slow rate. So this particular EKG tells us that the upper chambers are squeezing, but somehow the signal is not getting down to the bottom chambers. And the bottom chambers fortunately are doing their own thing and allowing the patient to uh, at least uh, stay alive. Um, so the treatment for this is what I just showed you before, which is a pacemaker. So the pacemaker, we put a, a lead in the upper chamber of the heart, which is seeing the P waves. Uh, and then if the P wave is not followed by a normal QRS complex, the pacemaker can give a little signal that will uh, stimulate the bottom chamber of the heart and thus restore uh, the normal uh, pattern of events of a P wave followed by a QRS. Uh, and this is, what, this is another version uh, of a pacemaker, uh, which is a so-called leadless pacemaker. This is a current, uh, uh, most um, uh, newest type of pacemaker device, which has no leads, uh, and it uh, is placed in uh, one of the chambers of the heart, but can see what's going on in the other chamber of the heart. Uh, and as you see here, the, the device is attached to the, the trabeculae or the, 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 the muscle uh, ridges uh, in the right ventricle in this manner, and this little device here serves the same function uh, as, this, uh, as this device, however, without the leads. And the way that we insert that device is through the, through the vein in the groin called the femoral vein, and we pass it up into the heart and it gets anchored into the muscle here. Uh, the latest and greatest of these devices, as I said, is also able to listen to what's going on in the upper chamber. So if it hears a P wave, it waits. And if it doesn't see that there's a QRS complex happening, it stimulates the heart and provides the, the necessary back, backup. Uh, and in the patient that uh, we just uh, discussed, the 76 year old gentleman who presented with multiple episodes of fainting, uh, this particular device uh, was able to restore, uh, his, restore him to a basically normal function. And he, was able to leave the hospital and has not had any further episodes of fainting. Um, what's another 
uh, example of, of, of how uh, an electrophysiologist uh, can help. Uh, well, here's a story of a 28-year-old young man uh, who literally dropped dead uh, while playing basketball. Uh, you may have heard of, of some of these stories, particularly in, in high profile, uh, famous athletes. Uh, fortunate for him, uh, there was a, a little device uh, or there was a device uh, uh, at the at court side uh, and uh, he was resuscitated uh, with something called a defibrillator. Uh, perhaps uh, you guys have seen these at uh, in your schools or, or in restaurants or at airports. Uh, it's also called an AED. Um, which uh, stands for uh, Automatic External Defibrillator. Uh, and basically, it's the device that you've seen on TV uh, where people uh, put pads or paddles on someone's chest and they say clear and they deliver shock to the heart to get the heart rhythm uh, back to normal. Well, uh, not that I expect you to, to recognize uh, what this particular uh, gentleman had as an underlying electrical rhythm problem, uh, but this is an EKG uh, that shows these really weird looking T waves. Remember how the T waves uh, uh, in the PQRS uh, T that I showed you in the normal EKG look like they were upright. Uh, well, here you see that they're actually inverted uh, and very weird biphasic, meaning going up and then down uh, or inverted out here. This is not a normal looking EKG. And this is a very classic EKG for something called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a, um, um, uh, a fancy way of saying a thickening of the heart muscle. But as a result of the thickening of the heart muscle, the electrical system of the heart is also impacted and affected. Uh, and again, the, the abnormalities of the electrical system are seen uh, on the EKG uh, and are noted in these uh, abnormal uh, T waves. Uh, and this is a, um, an abnormality that is associated with a risk of dying suddenly. And typically, uh, it's at uh, a peak exertion um, uh, and certainly has happened, uh, sadly, in competitive athletes. And if it's not recognized, uh, uh, the patient can have either recurrent episodes of fainting or, worst scenario, die. Fortunately, we have a treatment for this. Uh, and uh, I mentioned to you that there's something called an external defibrillator, where there are also implantable defibrillators. And this is an example uh, or a picture of uh, something called a subcutaneous defibrillator, uh, which means that it's inserted uh, underneath the skin. Uh, and uh, again, this is, uh, this is not what it would look like. This would all be underneath the patient's skin. You wouldn't see this from the outside. Uh, this is what a defibrillator looks like. It's a little bit bigger than the pacemaker. Uh, you can see it uh, compared to my uh, uh, palm. Uh, this is what a, a pacemaker looks like, and this is what a defibrillator looks like. Hopefully you guys can see that. Uh, and the nice news about this is this is a life-saving therapy uh, and allows uh, and allowed certainly this gentleman, uh, this young man to return to his uh, uh, normal activity knowing that he had a, a defibrillator with him 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, and then he could rest easy that he wouldn't have a dangerous arrhythmia problem uh, be, the, uh, be the cause of him uh, dying sudden. Um, so uh, we're able to basically uh, protect him uh, from this potentially dangerous heart rhythm problem. Here's a, another thing that cardiac electrophysiologists do. Uh, a 35-year-old woman with very frequent and worsening palpitations uh, for many, many years, uh, they were blamed on her having anxiety. But in fact, when she finally saw um, one of my colleagues, she was actually diagnosed with an arrhythmia. Um, and so if you recall, uh, we saw an EKG before where if you compare it to a normal EKG, I think you could all agree that this looks like uh, an EKG where the heart rhythm is going very, very rapidly. And in fact, uh, the um, uh, problem here was an abnormal electrical connection uh, in her heart that uh, using a different kind of uh, 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 procedure that we do, we were able to find that electrical abnormality, the electrical focus uh, in the patient's heart, 
uh, and then using a special type of wire, uh, something called an ablation catheter, we find the area of abnormality and by applying heat or a special kind of energy to the tip of, of this catheter, and I'll show you a real uh, picture of one of those catheters in a moment, uh, we're able to get rid of that electrical focus that is responsible for the very rapid heart rhythm uh, and uh, basically cure this lady of her um, uh, arrhythmia problem. And so the long standing uh, episodes of palpitation that she had had that were blamed on uh, um, anxiety uh, miraculously went away. And the nice thing about uh, uh, what we do, particularly for these types of fast heart rhythm problems, is that we can actually cure patients of an electrical abnormality like the one that was causing this lady's uh, symptoms, uh, and she'll be cured for life. Uh, and it uh, really, really makes us uh, happy when we can tell a patient with, you know, 98% certainty, you'll not have this as a problem again with a very, 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 very safe um, uh, procedure uh, with, with a very, very small risk of doing anything bad or having any complication. So here is, here is a, a look at the, the, the type of catheter that actually can deliver the type of uh, heat energy that then... Um, uh, gets rid of the electrical abnormality or the focus in the heart tissue. So here's a picture of the catheter touching uh, heart tissue in a, in, a, in a cartoon. But not only could we measure uh, the temperature that is, uh, 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 that is created uh, in this heart tissue, and we know what the temperature needs to be in order for the um, heart tissue to be uh, uh, permanently altered so that we can fix the uh, electrical abnormality. But we also know how much force is generated. So how much pressure that we're pressing against the, the heart. Uh, and uh, we could measure that. Here's 20 grams of force. Uh, and then there are lots of other uh, measurements that we can take. Here's a different type of catheter and, and how that catheter is able to, um, to determine the force. There's uh, fancy engineering that goes on in the tip of these catheters um, that literally are the size of a, uh, of, of a uh, or, or the thickness of a wire that would use to, to, to charge your cell phone. So um, that's how thin these, these wires are, these catheters are, but this is how complex um, the engineering is uh, in these wires in order for us to be able to manipulate them in the heart and get all of this kind of information and be able to fix a, a patient's uh, uh, heart rhythm problem. Um, so I showed you a pacemaker, I showed you a defibrillator, I'm showing you uh, one way of doing uh, something called an ablation to fix uh, someone's uh, heart rhythm abnormality. Uh, let me show you another video, hopefully this one will work. This is uh, a, again a, a cartoon or an animation. Uh, of a patient, uh, patient's heart. This is looking in the inside of the heart, uh, where in, instead of um, uh, using a catheter, we use a balloon, and we place the balloon uh, in a vein of the heart. And by making the balloon really cold, we can actually create a freezing lesion uh, in the heart at, uh, at one time. Uh, and create a, a change in the patient's electrical system uh, to treat a different kind of problem uh, called atrial fibrillation, which I mentioned to you before. On top of the different types of catheters and balloons and things like that that we have uh, to treat patients' heart rhythms, uh, we also have lots of ways of looking at the heart's electrical system. So it's way more sophisticated than that little cartoon that I showed you with the the single squiggles of the heart's electrical signals, we can actually uh, create these beautiful three-dimensional uh, maps of the heart's electrical system uh, and then overlay the heart's electrical system on the heart's structure. And then we could manipulate uh, that with our fancy computer systems and, and open up uh, the heart uh, so that we're looking at, this is a single chamber of the heart, but it's been it's been filleted open so that we can actually see our catheters moving uh, in the chamber of the heart real time while we're doing uh, our, our complex uh, uh, arrhythmia work. 
So the technology in our field uh, is cutting edge. Uh, the technology drives what we're able to do uh, in electrophysiology, and it's really, really very satisfying and, and, and a lot of fun. Um, so here's a last story uh, of a different type of a technique um, uh, that doesn't specifically treat the patient's electrical problem, but actually treats a problem that can happen when the patient has an arrhythmia. So this particular lady was an 85-year-old woman who was on a blood thinner uh, for an irregular heartbeat, uh, uh, an irregular heartbeat that I showed you before, something called atrial fibrillation. But unfortunately, on the blood thinner, she fell and she hit her head. And because she was on the blood thinner, she started bleeding into her brain. Uh, however, she needs protection against a stroke because atrial fibrillation can cause patients to have a stroke. So when a patient's in atrial fibrillation and the upper chamber of the heart is not squeezing in a nice synchronous way, you know that when blood sits around in a, in a test tube or something like that, it has a tendency to clot. In the heart, when the patient's in atrial fibrillation, the uh, area where, and here's that EKG of a patient in atrial fibrillation. Remember, you don't see any regular atrial activity here. Well, in the heart, the place where these clots can form are in a little chamber of the heart called the left atrial appendage. Uh, we believe that the great majority of clots that form during atrial fibrillation form in the left atrial appendage. The best therapy is to take a blood thinner medicine, which basically thins the blood to prevent clots from forming anywhere uh, in, 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 in the body. But in this particular case, keeping this lady on a blood thinner medicine would have put her at incredible risk uh, for bleeding again and bleeding again into her brain. So we have another technology which actually walls off uh, this little uh, atrial appendage. So here's a picture of this left atrial appendage and we deliver this device, which is called the left atrial appendage occlusion device. You may have seen commercials for this on TV. Uh, the, the current device that's uh, approved by the, by the FDA is called the Watchman device. Uh, but this Watchman device basically walls off the appendage so that any clot that might form here can't, can't escape uh, and cause a stroke. And I think you guys have had uh, uh, some talks about uh, 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 stroke uh, uh, and what happens when a clot leaves uh, the heart and goes to the brain or or goes down an artery and, and can cause a heart attack and that sort of thing. So this is frankly an alternative uh, for this lady who couldn't be on a blood thinner. And it's also something that electrophysiologists do. Um, it uh, uh, again is a procedure that we do in our electrophysiology laboratory. And I'll show you a picture of an EP laboratory uh, at the end of the talk. Um, but we do that by delivering this uh, special type of catheter. Uh, and we poke across from the right atrium into the left atrium and we place this device in the left atrial appendage. So uh, the types of procedures that we do uh, are minimally invasive. Uh, they have a very, very high safety profile with a very low risk. Uh, they're very technology driven, uh, which is what also makes our, uh, our area of expertise uh, exciting. Uh, and we try to remain at the forefront of all the uh, technologic advances on, on a month to month basis, quite honestly, it's very exciting times. Um, typically our patients come in uh, uh, for one day procedures. So they'll come in in the morning, uh, they'll have one of these invasive procedures done, whether it be insertion of a pacemaker, implantation of a defibrillator or an ablation procedure. And they usually go home later that day or they, or they go home typically, uh, or, or they can go home the very next morning. But usually patients' uh, uh, hospital experience is a very short one. Um, here's a picture of an EP laboratory. This is not my entire staff. That's me. Uh, you see me in your, your video screen. This is one of my colleagues, Dr. Bassine. Uh, some of our nurses and our techs, uh, some of our nurse practitioners uh, and physician's assistants. Uh, this is only a bunch of us, uh, but uh, um, our particular laboratory uh, with all our staff has about 25 people. Uh, but this is what an EP laboratory looks like. Uh, this is a patient's bed. Um, uh, I think for my next talk, I'll probably get you a better picture of this uh, rather than looking at our smiling faces. 
Uh, but we have all this, these fancy TV screens which allow us to plug in all of that uh, mapping uh, and other visualization uh, technology so we can see what we're doing. Uh, and this is an X-ray machine and some fancy OR lights that allow us to, uh, 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 to see what we're, what we're doing. Um, and that's my introduction to uh, electricity uh, makes the heart uh, go around. So I'm happy to answer any questions over the next uh, 10, 15 minutes. All right. If you want to uh, stop screen sharing, I'll open up the chat and you sure. can take a look at the questions that come in. Sure. We have, you know, 1,500 people here, so they'll probably come in quickly, but just okay. answer what you can get to. Super. So, uh, so why are blood thinners recommended instead of surgery uh, if it's a low risk? Well, the fact of the matter is, though, many clots come from that particular location. Not all clots come from that particular location. So the best protection I can give a patient um, against clots forming anywhere in the body uh, and having a problem um, uh, with stroke or whatever, uh, the blood thinner is the best therapy. Also, generally speaking, uh, the risk of being on a blood thinner for the great majority of people is really, really pretty small. Uh, and uh, subjecting them to a procedure uh, doesn't give them total body protection. It gives them only protection from where most of the clots come from. Uh, uh, and uh, is also a procedure that has some, you know, small risk of complication that might be a little bit higher than what the risk is of a complication uh, uh, with uh, the being on a blood thinner. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, what is going on in the heart when a person faints? Well, in the uh, uh, simplest analysis, if the heart stops pumping, uh, or is pumping very slowly, then in order for you to maintain consciousness or stay conscious, you need to have blood going to your brain. Well, if the heart stops pumping and there's no blood going to your brain, you faint. Um, uh, uh, what's going on in the heart can be that the heart's going very slowly or, or that it's pumping very, 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 very rapidly, so rapidly that again, it's inefficient to keep the blood pumping and uh, perfusing the brain. Um, so, uh, a, a good question here. It says, what about cardiomegaly? How is the electrical rhythm of the heart affected? Uh, and what can you do to fix the electrical rhythm then? So, cardiomegaly uh, is a, a term that describes an enlarged heart. Uh, and remember, the electrical system of the heart is built into the uh, muscle of the heart. So a heart that's large uh, can affect the electrical system of the heart uh, by stretching uh, the electrical system of the heart or causing scarring of the electrical system of the heart. So in some patients, uh, cardiomegaly can be associated with any and all of the different types of arrhythmias that uh, I mentioned to you. It could be associated with a very slow heart rhythm. It could be associated with a very fast heart rhythm. Um, in general, uh, uh, the treatment uh, for uh, 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 patients who can have a, an electrical problem uh, based upon a, a muscle problem of the heart is first to best treat the muscle problem of the heart. And then depending upon the type of arrhythmia they have, if it's very slow, they get a pacemaker. If they have a dangerous rhythm that puts them at risk for uh, dropping dead suddenly, they can have a defibrillator. If they have uh, a fast heart rhythm that potentially can uh, uh, be fixed with an ablation procedure, then we do an ablation procedure. So it's, it's always one of the primary rules in, um, uh, in, medica in medicine, in all types of medicine, is to first to treat the underlying cause. So if the underlying cause of the cardiomegaly can be identified, uh, you need to treat that. And then whatever rhythm abnormalities happen as a result of the cardiomegaly, uh, you then you treat that with the various uh, tools uh, and procedures that uh, I, I, I showed you. Uh, so uh, one question is, uh, is it dangerous uh, if someone with an abnormality like an SVT, like a supraventricular tachycardia, doesn't have an ablation or a treatment? Well, it turns out that uh, for certain types of uh, SVTs, uh, we know based upon the data uh, that having an ablation procedure is probably over the long haul 
a much safer way to go about treating a patient's arrhythmia problem. That doesn't mean that there aren't medications that are also potentially effective at treating the supraventricular tachycardia uh, or the fast heart rhythm. The problem is, however, that medications are not always 100% effective. Uh, an ablation procedure, particularly in the ones that we can fix with great certainty, are as close to 100% as we get in anything in medicine. So uh, a medication treatment uh, may not be 100% effective. Uh, and frankly, uh, uh, medications uh, have a certain side effect profile that's associated with them. So especially young people sometimes don't like the, uh, the side effects that they have when they take a medication. They have to remember to take the medication every single day. There's a cost associated with medication. So if there's an alternative therapy where in, in a single sitting with one day in the hospital, I can fix you for the rest of your life, uh, that's the, the, the decision that patients and uh, we are faced with when we talk about um, uh, supraventricular tachycardia treatment. Um, so quick uh, clarifying question. Uh, oh, uh, what is SVT? SVT is supraventricular tachycardia. It's a fast heart rhythm that uh, has its basis in the upper chambers of the heart, above the ventricles, supraventricular. Um, uh, can one have an atrial tachycardia? Absolutely. You can have a focus in the atrium that is firing in a regular way that causes a rapid uh, rhythm problem. Uh, can an arrhythmia be hereditary or predominantly down to lifestyle and diet? It can be any and all of those things. There are definitely uh, genetics uh, that we understand uh, to be associated with uh, certain cellular abnormalities where the the, the, the channels uh, in the uh, muscle cells of the heart are affected. And um, again, uh, at the, bo the bottom line is that the heart is, a, is an electrical organ. And at the uh, uh, cellular level, there are electrical currents through the sodium channels and through the calcium channels and through the potassium channels. And if you're in high school, you probably, uh, uh, or, or older, uh, you've probably seen uh, uh, pictures of these uh, calcium channels and sodium channels and potassium channels and understand how the electrical currents uh, in the muscle cells uh, can be affected. Uh, so there are certain genetic abnormalities that actually predispose patients to having arrhythmias based on abnormalities in, in those uh, channels. There are also situations either because of lifestyle, uh, uh, previous heart attacks, um, hypertension or high blood pressure, uh, valvular problems of the heart where the valves uh, don't work the way they're supposed to, where over time uh, result on stress in the heart then, that then cause some uh, uh, arrhythmia problems as well. So electrical abnormalities of the heart can come from, uh, you can be born with them uh, or you can develop them due to lifestyle uh, or other medical problems. Uh, how effective is applying carotid massage when a patient is experiencing SVC, SVT prior to treating with pharmaceuticals? Uh, that's a sophisticated question by an EMT-like person or a medical uh, person. So carotid massage, which basically the carotid artery lives here in the neck, uh, is a maneuver where if you press firmly where you feel the pulse, it can actually slow uh, the heart rate and terminate certain types of uh, SVTs and bring the heart rate uh, back to normal. Uh, uh, sometimes that's the most accessible maneuver uh, that we have uh, while we're getting uh, certain medications available that are typically given either intravenously, um, which are the fastest acting ones, uh, and sometimes, believe it or not, carotid massage in conjunction with, with certain medications uh, can, be, um, uh, can be effective. Another maneuver, which is a common maneuver uh, that does the same thing as carotid massage is a so-called Valsalva maneuver, which is basically bearing down. So think of doing a push-up or squeezing like you're having a difficult bowel movement. Uh, that, can, that can cause the same uh, effect on the heart's electrical system to slow a heart rhythm and terminate uh, an SVT. Um, so how does freezing or heating the tissue help to treat these conditions or abnormalities? So the electrical system of the heart lives within the muscle of the heart. If we can identify the area in the heart where the electrical abnormality is coming from, 
if we basically scar that area, and it's a very discrete scar, but think of it like, uh, like short circuiting an abnormal circuit, we can use either heat energy or freezing energy. There's some other energy modalities that are coming down the pike. Um, but the bottom line is if you, if you permanently damage uh, that abnormal area, that that abnormal area can't be electrically active anymore and cause you um, uh, to have the electrical problem. So uh, what was my path to where I am today? Hmm, okay. Uh, I don't know exactly why, but even from early on in uh, uh, high school, junior high school, I was very interested in biology and science. Uh, I think I knew very early on that I always wanted to be a doctor. Uh, I love interacting with people. Uh, I love interacting with patients. Um, one thing uh, that uh, uh, doctors um, uh, have uh, is an immediate uh, um, relationship with a patient because typically patients are vulnerable and they're willing to um, uh, share with you their their deepest uh, 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 secrets and medical problems or whatever just if they know that you're a doctor uh, and it's 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 an honor uh, and a privilege to actually begin to have that relationship uh, with a patient but anyway I, I knew I wanted to be a doctor from very early on uh, I pursued that uh, I will say that in college knowing that I wanted to be a doctor I actually did all of my pre-medical uh, work, uh, but I majored in religion, uh, not because I was interested in becoming a priest or anything like that. I was just interested in, uh, in keeping uh, my, um, uh, my mind open to lots of other ways of thinking, et cetera. But in the meantime, finished all my science courses and all my pre-med courses uh, on, a, on a path to medical school. And I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Went to medical school, uh, uh, knew I wanted to be back in New York, I was able to do my training here in New York, was always fascinated by the heart, uh, and, and, and here we are. And I've been in New York since, um, since I finished medical school. Someone asked me, I'm Greek, uh, uh, so there you go. Um, so uh, BSMD programs, someone is asking what my thoughts are regarding BSMD programs. I think uh, for for people who know that they want to be physicians, uh, uh, as long as you don't stay narrow in the, in the BSMD program and expand your horizons a little bit by taking English courses and maybe learning another language or that sort of thing, I think the BSMD course is a great fast track, uh, especially if it saves you a year or so in, um, uh, in, 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 in achieving you know, your, your MD. Um, I personally think uh, that uh, I'm a better doctor for not having been only a scientist and only a, 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 you know, a taking science courses and, and uh, the pre-med type of thing. I think it's, it's great to always have um, uh, 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 side, side uh, interests uh, and uh, expand, your, expand your mind by exposing yourself to as much as possible. Um, what, uh, what perspective did you take with you to medicine from majoring in uh, religion? Um, huh, that's, uh, that's probably, <laughs> that's, that's probably a, 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 different, uh, a different talk, uh, but uh, I think uh, it uh, gave me perspective that, uh, uh, you know, the same way that there are, you know, many, many different religions in the world, uh, uh, gave me, I think, respect for, uh, for people's different perspectives, uh, their are their different concerns. Uh, people come from different walks of life, uh, had different life experiences, uh, which sometimes shapes also, you know, the interaction that I have with them uh, in a way that uh, helps me to make a better decision with them about their medical care. Um, uh, Thank you for the perspective. Uh, yeah, great. I'm seeing some people messaging that uh, they're also majoring in philosophy or taking art class, art courses, or as, as minors. Uh, and I think it's really great. Uh, uh, one question is, what advice would I give to someone who's interested in this field? Uh, do you mean, if you mean electrophysiology, uh, uh, I mean, uh, or, or if you just mean uh, medicine, 
The point is become the best doctor that you can be, become the most complete person that you can be by not uh, pigeonholing yourself in, in one track uh, the, the whole time uh, and keep your horizons, uh, uh, keep your horizons open. Um, to give you an idea, uh, many, many, many years after uh, finishing my medical training and my residency and being in practice and whatever, uh, I decided to go back to graduate school a few years ago uh, and I completed a, 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 a degree at MIT two years ago. I graduated from MIT with a, um, um, a, a, a master's in business. Uh, not, not because I'm interested in going to business. I love being a doctor, uh, but I thought that uh, the, the lessons I would learn um, uh, from an MIT education uh, uh, could somehow be used in, in a, um, an innovative way in my uh, in, in my day to day life and my day to day work, so always keep your 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 uh, enthusiasm for a life of learning going. And I think that's the other wonderful thing about uh, medicine is that medicine uh, to be a doctor uh, uh, and to be a physician, you also have to be committed to a, a lifetime uh, of learning. And I think people who are interested in uh, uh, in medicine have that. Uh, have that uh, uh, enthusiasm for always wanting to be challenged and stay ahead and always wanting to be reading about or hearing about or learning about the next, uh, the next new thing. Uh, work-life balance, uh, what, how is the work-life balance of a physician and a cardiologist? Uh, it's hard work. Uh, uh, you know, patients, uh, patients don't follow a schedule. Uh, they, uh, they get sick in the middle of the night, they get sick on weekends. Um, they have questions or problems. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's a balance that you learn to, uh, uh, to, um, to manage uh, with your colleagues. I have a wonderful team. I work very closely with my colleagues uh, and uh, my, my associated uh, care uh, professionals. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we do a great job. Um, I think it's important to have outside interests that are not medical. Uh, so uh, it keeps me fresh. Uh, uh, when I get tired of the the day to day stress of uh, of of, uh, of of work, uh, I have other things that I like to do uh, in life. So, uh, can patients with these implantable devices, like pacemakers and defibrillators, get scans like MRIs and CT scans? Absolutely. All of the all of the presently implanted devices, all of them are MRI and CAT scan compatible. Uh, I do allow, uh, do I allow high school students to shadow me? Uh, and is it allowed at my hospital? Absolutely. Uh, I've actually been, uh, I've had high school students shadow me for years. Um, if you're interested, perhaps Josh can uh, uh, get us uh, uh, in contact and let me know. Uh, I'm happy to, to have a, a, a high schooler shadow me uh, or someone on my team. Um, Yes, for CT scans and also for MRI scans. You can have uh, an MRI scan with a defibrillator. Someone was answering no for MRI, but that's not true any longer. There are wrinkles to that. Older devices can't have an MRI scan, but uh, in the last uh, decade or so, uh, uh, certainly the last five to 10 years, uh, there are, uh, and currently all the devices that we implant uh, are, um, uh, are, are, are MRI compatible. Uh, can college students also shadow uh, potentially? Again, uh, let's uh, work on that as a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Uh, you can contact me and um, happy, to con happy to consider uh, having you shadow me. Um, cool. Hey, Dr. Skipateris. Thank you so much for speaking today and joining us. Thank you, it's really a pleasure. Um, for everyone else that's still here, there is Tumor Talk tonight at 4 p.m. with Dr. D'Amico, so make sure to tune in for that if you're interested. But uh, thank you again for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Josh.